Merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'm happy to be back at NorthSec, especially on a beautiful day like today. It was awesome to go have lunch outside in, in super sunny Old Port, Montreal. It's the best time of <laughs> the year to visit, as I tell all my, my American colleagues now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm from around here. I've been I've studied a long time ago. Uh, quantum cryptography at the University of Montreal, right here. And after that, I joined the industry. I uh, did uh, uh, yeah, most of my career doing cryptographic development. I'm now at MSR, uh, working on all sorts of cool advanced uh, crypto technologies, trying to bring them to market and see what, what, what can be um, the future of security. Uh, a lot of it deals with uh, privacy enhancing, identity technologies, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, a lot of the focus last year, uh, the last few years has been in post-quantum cryptography. We're avidly waiting for the uh, NIST decision for what's going to be the next post-quantum algorithm. If NIST makes the announcement during my talk, please just interrupt me and, and let me know. We've been waiting on that news. But like most of the world in the last uh, two years, there's been some interruptions because of COVID and uh, I joined an effort to help with uh, the smart health card framework, which I'm here to talk about. So first, what's, what's that? What's a smart health card? So I hope the organizers <laughs> and, or did not invite me because I thought it was smart cards, especially we heard that our host here uh, is interested in two smart, smart cards. Uh, well, yeah, it has nothing to do with that. That's a, a, an acronym or a backronym. Uh, from the medical community, it stands for, I have to read it because I don't know it by heart, the su Substitutable Medical Application Reusable Technology. It's a set of APIs in the healthcare industry to, to, to avoid vendors lock-in and whatnot. So it's for health cards to, build, to be able to uh, present a medical information in, in a convenient way. So what it means for uh, the COVID, so in, in the US, uh, nationwide, people had these little paper cards. Uh, here in Canada, the provinces at the beginning, before the QR codes came in, everybody had a different solution, either a little sticker with the information, either a PDF you would download, which would contain your name, date of birth, your vaccination history. And that's what you could use to prove to various people uh, that you've been vaccinated. So, of course, that's very... Um, susceptible to, to fraud and, and forgery uh, modifications. So the question becomes, how do you create a, a, a digital version that can prove authenticity and cannot be modified? And so that's what a smart health card is. Um, so the QR code, first, it's not a, a, a URL like it typically is. When you scan these with your phone, it brings you to a website. These QR codes actually contain all the information. And that's all you need. You don't need to a call back somewhere to verify the information. Of course, most of you here in Quebec, uh, you, you, you might have not known that you've been using the standard. Uh, here it's been branded as VaxiCode by, by the government. Uh, so, but your VaxiCode is actually a smart health card. So if you want to learn more about what's contained there, then uh, I guess that's a, a good talk for you. Before I delve into the details of of the framework, how it came to be, and some of the security properties. I'm just going to give a description of how this QR code is created to just have a clear representation in your, in your mind of what's going on. So the, the paper information, name, date of birth, vaccination history, it's transformed into what's called a FHIR bundle. FHIR is another healthcare uh, standard. It's called, I have to read it again, Fast Health Interoperability Resources. Uh, so that's how the, the medical EHR vendors, electronic health record vendors, they, they, they talk through fire protocols. So it's just a JSON structure with, if you can zoom in, you see the, the highlighted data is what's on, on, on the paper. That gets then uh, encoded into a JSON web token payload that has some metadata about who created um, the smart health cards, some, some uh, other metadata, the fire bundles in there. And then this is uh, signed into a JSON web signature. But because the target is a small QR code with very limited payload size, we have to make an effort to make it small so it's minimized, compressed, 
and then uh, it's base64 URL. Then it is signed using the JSON web signature format, a standard, which is some header that's added. The signature is added there. And um, then anyone who has this data is able to verify because they can look up the public key of the, the, of the issuer that's in the header and, and verify the signature. This is then transformed uh, into a numeric QR encoding. If you know anything about QR code, that's very standard. If you didn't know anything about that, like I did a year ago, a year plus ago, then you go read that, and it's just a normal way to do that, to transform any data into a QR code. And voila, you have your, your final QR image. Of course, there's, there's a lot of details uh, surrounding um, what's, what's happening there. So that's where uh, all, all this is defined and specified in the Smart Health Card framework. So the goal of, of this framework, I've highlighted here, is to provide a way to, to provide authenticated and immutable medical facts. So it's not to act as a, uh, an identity document. It's not meant to be a green check mark saying, yes, I can go into this, this thing. It's policies around the world, policies even across time, week to week change. So the medical community wanted to provide a way just here's the medical facts. These facts happen, and then some other part of the, of the, of the, of the process needs to make decisions if that's a, a, an OK condition to do activity X or whatever. So uh, as I said, it's not an identity document. Uh, it only has a, a name, date of birth, and it needs to be matched onto some other form of identification to make sure it belongs to the right person. And all these... This minimal set of data has been highly debated in, in uh, the framework community to see is that not enough data, too much data, and the level of risk about the usage of these things, and whatever level of fraud, right? So somebody with a matching name and date of birth could use your QR code. So, OK, acceptable, that's fine. Uh, all the specifications are open, um, and the work started before the pandemic. Uh, in the medical industry, but of course it got accelerated and, and COVID became the focus of the use case. And the success of this framework versus other approaches, there have been a lot of competing proposals uh, in the US. There have been some other approaches uh, selected in Europe. For example, they have the digital COVID certificate, the DCC thing, which is very similar to the Smart Health Cards, just different set of decisions. Um, they came up with a slightly different format. India has their own solution, and, and uh, other parts of the world as well. But this one, you can find everything you want to know about that at the smartelk.cards. Um, my team, actually, we developed this, this portal, uh, demoportals.smarthealth.cards. It allows you, if you want to go scan your own QR code and see all the details of it, as I've shown in the previous slide, you, you, you can do that. And a part of the success of the framework is its large uh, implementation base. So it's been picked up by, by Apple and Google. So they, in your phone, it, they're, they support it net natively. There's a lot of um, sp specific apps in different jurisdictions, like Vaxicode here, uh, New York, they, they call it the Excelsior Pass, and uh, Louisiana also had uh, their own wallet. A lot of states in the US chose to just use uh, the common uh, apps without their own in, in province or in state app. Um, okay, let's leave it at that for now here. Just to give you an idea of the adoption of the Smart Health Card framework, you can see it's, it's mostly in North American or Canada and, and US um, uh, standard with the deployments, but there's some other parts of the world that have uh, adopted it and are more and more. Okay. So now, what's, uh, all these things are, are issued. So first, um, to become a smart health card issuer, you just set up a, a uh, you just create a key pair, very conventional cryptography. And uh, well, in Canada, it's mostly the provinces and, and health ministries that do that. In the US, it's a bit more complicated. There's no central um, health authority that oversees everything. Uh, and if they do, they don't have the mandate to, uh, to issue a certificate. Uh, 
vaccination certificates to everybody. So it's mostly industry-based. So you will have some state registries, you're going to have some big pharmacies, uh, like Walgreens or CVS, you're going to have uh, your hospitals, they're going to be issuers. So there's a the wide variety of, of parties. So they can all self-host and, and create their own key pair. And when a user given a, 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 a specific uh, interaction with, with that party, uh, can, can prove that, well, they got their vaccination, then they, they can get this QR code. It can be held in a, on any uh, medium. So it could be in a specific app. It could be uh, on the Apple wallet or the Google wallet. It could be on, printed on paper. It makes no difference. And then later, when you go and present that to a party that has a verifier, you can, um, uh, they can just download the key that's identified in the QR code and validate um, the information. So in fact, what, that's one value of using a framework that's common and that's standard, is that when I came here during the pandemic visiting, I had my Virginia QR code, and at the beginning the Vaxi code uh, would not validate it because it did not uh, recognize external keys, but at some point it did, so I was super happy that I could go to a restaurant, just scan my, my US QR code, and it was validated uh, by the app, just because it was based on a standard and not a, a one-off solution, and vice versa. So uh, my family, when they came to visit in the US, also they're, they're, they're external, because you have two versions here. The one that's made for travel is, is a confirmed smart health card, so it can be validated anywhere in the world that uh, supports the standard. So now, as I mentioned, anybody can just start issuing smart health, smart health cards. Very easy to, to self-set up. There's a lot of software for it. Of course, not everybody should be trusted to be a valid smart health card issuer. So the question becomes, OK, how do you create that list? In, in security and cryptography, we have this notion of uh, PKI, right? Public key infrastructures. That's a very convenient, that's the most common mechanism to establish trust. There's a trusted authority, and it can delegate trust in, in different environments, which in Canada was very simple, because everything here, the health care, is provided by, by the provinces. So here, each province became the authority about issuing these, these credentials. In, uh, in, in the US, it was a mismatch of different things, as I said before. So there was a need to, um, to create in PKI, we would call that a PKD, which is a public key directory. Um, and this organization, the VCI, which has been kind of renamed with a broader, um, with a broader scope to verifiable clinical information, their goal is not only to oversee the smart health card specification, but also to decide who is a trusted issuer. So there's a, a, a set to make sure that there are verified healthcare organizations that are actually and they have COVID vaccines, and then once they've been vetted and audited and, uh, and verified, then they can be part of this VCI trusted directory. In fact, all the Canadian provinces are part of that directory. Uh, the directory is public. If you go to vci.org, you can see all the information. You can verify there. In fact, <coughs> we were uh, part of uh, our team wrote some auditing software for that directory to make sure that everyone there is, is online, that they're key sets are crypto cryptographically, cryptographically uh, correct and um, that all the, uh, the information is, is uh, secure using the right TLS config and, and all these things. OK. So, um, so that's the kind of overview of the kind of smart health cards. I hope you have a, a clearer idea now what's in the, these QR codes. Uh, I'll now discuss a few, uh, just a uh, few, few more security aspects uh, because we're here at NordSec. Um, one thing that that became uh, very apparent, or soon, is that we would, uh, there was a need for a revocation feature for the smart health cards. You know, normal certificates can can be revoked, um, and in the Smart health cards, there's uh, at the beginning of the framework, because of the rapidity at which the, the standard came to be, 
Uh, and uh, because of the nature of the information, which is, are just clinical facts, so they should not you know, change or you don't lose access to these facts. So there, there's, I mean, the security practitioners among this group were not able to, to get a revocation feature day one in, 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 uh, in the specification. But of course, as, as it was easy to predict, there was some reported fraud and not really on the, on the, tech, on, on the cryptography of, of the system, but mostly on, on the, the human factor uh, here. I've seen some headlines in, in, in Quebec about either uh, nurses or medical practitioners getting bribed to get invalid uh, entry in the vaccination registry, or you could have fake the paper trail and coming from cross-jurisdiction to say that you had your vaccine, then you get issued a valid um, credential that can be later proven false by, by, by the police. So we had to develop uh, this revocation mechanism that, that was added to the specification. Uh, it came a, a, a bit later than, than after the first wave of QR codes were issued. So there are two mechanisms to revoke these cards. One that's forward-looking, where uh, these cards can now have a revocation ID built in that can be uh, listed on a well, we reuse the acronym CRL for card revocation list here. And there's a legacy one that derives a, a dynamic revocation ID based on the, on the content of the, the fire payload there. So you just do a hash of a few fields there. And these uh, uh, can also be time stamped in the certificate list, uh, the, the revocation list, so that if you're you know, a, a naughty user who got uh, fake your paper trail, and then got convinced to go get a, a, a vaccine and therefore a valid card, then if you get uh, your, your revocation ID, a card with a, the same revocation ID later, then you, you can be revoked up to a certain point, and then uh, later your card will be valid. So that's uh, one thing that, that emerged uh, after the initial launch of the framework. Uh, the other work that I've hinted to a, a bit earlier was the VCI directory auditing and snap shopping. So the, the, I mean, the cryptography and all the security of the, of the card itself is not too complicated. It's pretty standard. Uh, but the, uh, the devil is in the details. And a big part of the making sure of the, the security hygiene of the system is to making sure that these issuers are not, um, uh, are, they are trusted, right? So if you start seeing weird issuers there, there's going to be a lack of trust in the system. And the VCI got a lot of proposals to be joined, like, hey, I'm a clinic here, and I'd like to start issuing smart health cards. So there's been a, a big list of, of, of proposed issuers that have just been rejected because they didn't meet the, the minimal requirement of what's a trusted issuer. So um, yeah, so our team, we've been involved in the uh, creating of, of two things. Uh, one is uh, the audit script that I mentioned that just makes sure that once you pass the test to get into the directory, then you're still OK uh, day after day, and not just your, your security just goes crazy, or you go offline, or, or you disappear. Then uh, we, we keep track of that. Uh, the other uh, thing that we've enabled also is to create a snapshot of the directory, uh, including all the keys. Because the flow of, of uh, if you remember the, the diagram, is that when you verify this QR code, so if you're the Quebec app and you verify Quebec QR codes uh, you know, every five seconds, it's fine. You, you have the public key. But if you're at a Super Bowl uh, sports stadium with visitors from all around uh, the continent, then you might need to get different keys. And there's a lot of fetching keys all over the place. So you're able to download this offline version of the directory that, that the VCI provides. And you're, you're able to. Uh, to validate the QR codes uh, in an offline manner, which, yeah, for so big, when there's a lot of, of users and you don't want to have a lot of bandwidth, you could be a, like a transit station, New York metro station, for example, that would be useful. Um, OK, I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, I, let's see how am I on time. OK, that's good. So I wanted to present the work that's been done on smart health cards, but I wanted to reserve some time to talk about the future of digital identity. So I've been in this field for a while, and we've been pushing this idea of user-centric identity documents uh, for users to be able to prove 
any identity facts about themselves to whichever uh, stakeholder. It could be online, it could be in person. And I guess now the QR code that people had to present forever uh, in the last year, then that kind of un unlocked our, the, the imagination there and, and helped to explain some of these scenarios and make them very concrete. So as a, a immediate next step, um, we prototyped a, a, a system that's similar to the smart health cards, but that instead of having a medical payload, it could have any claims there. So any JSON web token payload or data, any attributes, uh, you can encode them in these QR codes. And you're able to uh, present them and verify them in, in, in a similar manner. So, um, okay, let's... But one important aspect of that uh, um, is the ability to add privacy on top of, of, the, fr of the framework. For smart health card, that's something that's been debated a lot. Okay, do, are you disclosing too much information every time you're presenting it? So when you go and board an airplane, you disclose your name, date of birth, and along with all this information already that they already know about you that, that, and way more data that you have to present. Well, when you go to see a movie, you typically wouldn't want to or need to present a date of birth and, and a name even. So um, for a general uh, identity document, then you don't want to force always presenting everything about yourself. And the main uh, identity document that people have in, in North America is a driver's license. That what you show to, to present uh, some Id identity attributes about yourself. So, to this claim QR framework, we've added the ability to, to present a subset of these things. So it's a, it's a simple mechanism versus more advanced cryptographic ones using zero-knowledge proofs that you, you could prove properties of yourself, like a, I have a date of birth and I can prove that I'm over 21, but uh, that's a bit more complicated. What's very easy is just the ability to take the equivalent of a black marker pen on your driver's license and just hide the data you don't want to show and present the rest. So we call that subset claim disclosure and the way it's achieved is that instead of the issuer encoding these claim data, these attributes directly, they're ashed and salted so that uh, for brute force resistance. And that's what gets encoded in, in uh, the, the QR code. And to disclose this value, you have to show to the verifier uh, these, these digests along with the data that was used to generate these digests. So it's, it's as if you're presenting this um, this uh, driver's license with little puzzle pieces cut off, and you can just see, you're seeing, uh, you don't know what I, the pieces I remove, but if I take a piece, I can put it back, and you see that it matches perfectly, and that's the only value that could have been there. So just as a, an example, um, I have a little demo, but I think my, my slides might be more illustrative. So I'll, I'll just start with these. So imagine I, I have this data that, that I want to encode in a QR code. So I have a JSON web token, there's an issuer, the example.org issuer, there's an expiry date, and these claims on the right are the ones that I want to be able to selectively disclose. So it's my name, my real date of birth, I'm super young. And then these are transformed by the issuer, and there are, there's a random salt, which is just a random value, and uh, along with this, with the claim attributes. And then these get hash using the salt and, and the claim value, and they get encoded in the JSON web signature payload. Then using the mechanism I've explained before, um, they, these gets transformed into a JSON web signature, they get, get signed, and then turn into a QR code. Now that I have that, if, if it's on paper, oh, sorry, I forget to, for, I forget to mention the last part on the, the little green uh, part of this GWS. It's, a, it's an appendix, so it's extra data, and it's actually the claim data that would allow a verifier to uh, understand these digests there that otherwise would be opaque. Now, when I'm presenting that, if I'm presenting that on paper for legacy kind of users, everything gets disclosed. But if I have a, an, an app, a client app that understands this, uh, the user could decide to remove some claims, let's say removing these two um, 
pieces of data from, from the claimed data object, and then regenerate the appendix with these two pieces removed, then regenerate the QR code, and present that instead. So what will the ver verifier do? It was going to verify that, yeah, the QR code is signed. The data that's on the bottom left side didn't change. That's the one that's signed. And I can prove that these two pieces out of four that I'm presenting corresponds to the data that was uh, encoded in there by the issuer. So that's the uh, mathematics of what I just said. <clears throat> I will go to my final slide instead of presenting the demo, which is something you can go and run yourself. It's an open source project, so if you want to do it, it's just a, a web portal um, that's going to uh, that allow you to try that. But I wanted instead to spend a minute to discuss what I think is the future of digital identity for, for a user-centric approach. Um, so uh, some of us cryptographers that are, are dealing with digital identity have been proposing some of these ideas for, for many years, almost 20 years ago, as part of a, a company here in Montreal that developed the, the U-Proof system that's listed down the, the list here, doing all sorts of cool zero-knowledge proofs on, on data and, and being to prove properties about yourself without disclosing these said attributes. And uh, it takes a lot of, uh, add some complexity to, to these systems. So, uh, I think these claim QR approach that I've just explained with the selective disclosure is kind of a let's go step by step in improving from the status quo and what's what's going on today. So that's why the, the type of projects I just presented, stepping off from from what people have been used to, uh, will allow us to get to these advanced features. Which um, so one, one interesting thing, development, is that there's a, a new ISO standard that, that's coming out. It's called the Mobile Driver's License, the MDL, which supports a flavor of selective disclosure like I've disclosed. And it's going to be for, you know, as the name says, for driver's licenses. I know it's going to be adopted in some parts of the States. I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about Canada. Um, but that, is a, a, that will be a big... Uh, a stepping stone and a big milestone for, for the world of user-centric digital identity. But there are more privacy features that are, will be needed also uh, for long-term long uh, benefits. One is unlinkability. So all these tokens that you receive that are signed by an issuer, a signature is just, yeah, it ends up being a random value, unpredictable value, but once you have it and you're presenting it, you're, ex you're presenting a, essentially a long-lived cookie to different parties. So if two parties collude or if a party goes back to the issuer and says, okay, I got a, a, a ticket for the claim said uh, it's an over 21 user. I don't know which one it is, but uh, you sign and the, the signature is uh, 06173, then say, oh yeah, I gave that to Christian like two months ago. So, um, so this data can be randomized using what's called blind signatures or you could proof your... Uh, you could prove you have a signature with zero knowledge proofs without disclosing its value itself. So there are some approaches in cryptography that will allow us to break this linkage between issuance and presentation. And derived claims, which I've briefly talked about earlier, are a good way also uh, to add some features and give power to the user. Um, for example, to be able to show that, yeah, my date of birth is such that I'm over 21 without disclosing it, or here I would say over 18, uh, or that my name does not is not listed on this denial list or this no-fly list or whatever without actually disclosing my name. So there's a lot of powerful techniques that have been explored. Uh, we've prototyped some of that. I'll just cite one of our, the projects I've been involved with in the past. Uprove does that, and there's uh, some activity in the um, W3C verifiable credential um, standard that's, that's upcoming, and, and people are um, also working on these, on these type of features. And you know, love it or hate it, the the Web three, uh, the Web three uh, blockchain community have been yeah, developing some of these these techniques, which uh, is going to be for some of their blockchain type use cases. But also, a lot of this, this base cryptography can be reused and applied in a wider uh, variety of scenarios. So I'm kind of very excited about this work and, and uh, the the future for user centric 
digital identity, which gives a lot of, of power and, and privacy to the user. So on these words, I'll, I'll conclude, and uh, I'm looking forward to the questions in the next session. Thank you. Thank you.